Hello, hi. Hi, I'm Dr. Rishi Goganeni, and uh, and welcome to our Facebook Live. For for those of you who might not know Ortho Virginia, we are the largest multi-specialty orthopedic practice uh, in Virginia. We have offices in Northern Virginia, which is where I practice. Uh, we also have offices in Richmond, in um, Lynchburg, Southwest Virginia, as well as Hampton Roads. If you'd like to get more information about Ortho Virginia, please go to our website, orthovirginia.com. A little bit about me, so. I went to medical school at, um, at Case Western in Cleveland. I followed it up with uh, orthopedic surgery uh, residency training in uh, Columbus, Ohio at the, at, the, at the Ohio State University. I then continued on to subspecialty training at the University of Florida, specifically in hip and knee uh, replacements. I started off my first um, uh, practice in California and finally moved here to, to Virginia to be closer to our family. We now have four small kids. Uh, we also have an old dog who's grumpy about all the new additions uh, to the family. All right, enough about me, let's get to our topic. So if you're new to the topic of arthritis, I, I recommend you find my, my previous Facebook Live presentation from last year, uh, which was about, um, about when to consider surgery for hip and knee arthritis. Um, so sort of a continuation of that topic is, is what we'll discuss today, which is new advances in hip and knee replacements. So let's dive right in. I think I'd like to cover about uh, six or seven points uh, today, uh, time permitting, and uh, and then we'll open it up to questions afterwards. So let's jump right in. So firstly, let me discuss uh, our modern approaches uh, to hip and knee replacements. So the word approach to us specifically means how we are entering uh, the joint, where we're placing our incisions and how we are getting in. So in North America, the most common approach to the hip used to be the, the posterior approach. Posterior means back. It's a, it's a good approach, it's a classic, but at the time, the dislocation rate was a bit higher, higher than we'd like to see. So the anterior approach started to gain popularity at, uh, at that time. It had a lower dislocation rate. Over time, both approaches have evolved, both have improved, and both of them now have similarly low dislocation rates. Uh, both approaches have also become less invasive, uh, decreasing the amount of muscle damage. Our newest scientific data, which just came out uh, earlier this year, now shows almost no difference uh, in outcomes between the two uh, between the, the two approaches. Having said all that, uh, I'm well versed in both approaches, and I use both as needed. My default is the anterior approach uh, for primary or first-time replacements. Uh, mainly because I prefer the patient uh, to be laying on their back um, during surgery. When they're on their back, it becomes easier to use the x-ray machine uh, or to check leg lengths uh, at the feet or the ankles um, than, when, than when they're on their side. For revision surgery, I usually gravitate to the posterior approach as it gives me more exposure and more access because there's more to do in a revision surgery. You know, there are implants that I need to, to remove that may already be present or fractures I need to fix or something like that. So, so for revisions, I typically do posterior approach. For knees, uh, data has shown that there is less pain and earlier return to uh, return of, this, of strength when we don't cut into the quadriceps tendon, that's the big tendon above your kneecap. There is a, a different approach where we can avoid that called a muscle sparing or a subvastus approach. Uh, in my practice, I do perform this approach if I can see and accomplish everything that I need to do in the surgery, because it is a more limited approach. If someone's arthritis is too severe or, or their knee is too tight, uh, sometimes this is not possible and I use a more traditional approach as needed. Um, but for most people, the muscle sparing or the subvastus approach is a good option. Um, next, let's move on to hip precautions. What does pre hip precautions mean? Well, you know, a replaced joint, although it works well, is still not equal to a, a native uh, native hip. So dislocation is still a risk, right? So what, when we say hip precautions, there are certain things or certain positions that we don't want people to get into. Posterior hip precautions, what we use when we do posterior approaches, means that you should not bend at the waist more than 90 degrees and you uh, while keeping your knees together and rotating your feet out. That's a bad combination. These are precautions uh, sometimes used uh, with this approach of the posterior approach. With the anterior approach, we usually don't need to use any hip precautions. Uh, it is okay to return to your daily activities right away and um, and it's okay to get into that, that position that I just described as well. 
Um, next, let's move on to robotic surgery. This is, this is definitely new technology that now allows us to be much more accurate in executing a personalized plan that we make for each patient. So before your surgery, way before your surgery, we are going to get a virtual 3D model of your specific hip or knee joint. Uh, and we plan for the exact sizes and the positions of all your implants uh, so that on the day of surgery, we can just use the robot to execute the the, the exact plan uh, that was made for you down to the millimeter. Ideally, the, the advanced preparation should make surgery day a very routine or boring day for us. No excitement on that day. Our accuracy has significantly improved with this technology, and this is something I now use routinely. Next, let's talk about materials. So the materials used to make our modern implants have also improved uh, over time. You may have heard in the past about, um, for example, metal on metal hip replacement. Sometimes you might see commercials about it. Um, not good commercials um, but these are these are not used anymore we don't typically do do these types of implants anymore nowadays when we do hip replacements we mainly use uh, modern materials such as uh, ceramic uh, for the ball that we use these these newer materials have allowed us to have much lower wear rates or the rate at which the these things wear down compared to the previous type of implants that we used to use um, Next, let's discuss pain management protocols. So in the past, the method of pain management um, was only to use narcotics. It was quite simple. If you had less pain, you used fewer pills. If you had more pain, you used more pills. And that was all there is to it. Um, it was not a good approach. It was something that still left people with a lot of pain and, and leaving them dependent sometimes on um, narcotics, which is you know not something that we should be doing. So in these modern times, what we now do is we've done a lot of research on this and we now use uh, several pro different protocols and several different strategies. Um, I use a, a, a protocol called a multimodal pain management uh, protocol. What that means is I use several different types of medications, not just narcotics, several different types of medications that all act together to keep your pain level low so that your need for narcotics is minimized or, or decreased as much as possible. We do still, there is still a role for narcotics, but we can use just, just use them very sparingly, assuming that the other medications that I'm gonna put somebody on will do their, their job. Um, we also use spinal anesthesia much more often these days uh, than general anesthesia. Uh, this is also better for pain control and also um, allows the anesthesiologist to do less general anesthesia in the patient, making for easier, easier um, uh, wake-ups and becoming alert much faster um, because we need the patient uh, to be walking and up on their feet pretty quickly too. Let's talk about incision closures. So how were incisions closed in the past? You know, you might have uh, maybe, maybe remember that in the past, these were done with either big stitches on the outside or staples or, or things like that, you know. Um, most of us don't do that much anymore. Um, these, the incisions can be closed in many different ways. You know, some, some of them will produce better cosmetic results than others and why not, right? So I mainly only use dissolvable stitches. All uh, of them are done under the skin. They do not need to be taken out uh, later on. I also use a skin glue on top uh, and uh, that basically seals the incision. And I also put on a water resistant dressing on top of all that. You can start showering right away as well. Uh, just no soaking yet, so no bathtubs or no pools uh, for a while, but showering is fine. And lastly, I want to discuss outpatient surgery as well. Um, in the past, when we used to do these, um, patients used to stay in the hospital, you know, three, four, five, seven days sometimes, and then go to a nursing home for another few weeks before they went home, right? Nowadays, we do this outpatient uh, for many patients, uh, which means that we can even do them in our outpatient surgery centers without any, even needing to be in a hospital. We have the patient go home same day. So right after the surgery, once the patient is more awake and, and, and alert, uh, we get the patient up and walking with physical therapy with a walker as, uh, within just you know one or two hours after the surgery. Once a patient has met all the criteria, they can go home. 
I usually prescribe um, uh, medications for a patient usually a few days before the surgery and the expectations that they already have them filled and they're already ready for them at home and they can start right away as soon as they get home. It's made outpatient surgery has made this much more accessible for people without needing to plan on hospital stays. So, all right. So as you can imagine, this is certainly not an exhaustive list, obviously. Uh, but this is at least a good representation, a uh, good representative list of some of the new advances uh, in hip and knee replacements. So with that, um, I'd like to open, a, open it up uh, for questions and let's discuss anything in more detail about any of this thing, uh, these things that you guys have, might have questions on. Thank you so much. Yes, we have a lot of questions. Please keep come, having them come in. So our first question is, after a replacement, can you still do active sports like mountain biking or singles tennis, or are you not allowed to do those? Yeah, great question. I get asked that a lot. And the answer is yes, you can. Um, it is generally a good idea uh, for someone who is already experienced in those activities uh, for them to get back to those things even after the replacement. For someone who doesn't have any experience in those, those uh, more strenuous or active activities beforehand, um, maybe that's a bit riskier to do those things after because their mechanics may not be as good. And so trying to learn those things with the new replacement is harder and, uh, and might be a little bit um, not as safe. So, but, but if someone who was doing those things before, it is fine to get back onto those things again afterwards. Thank you. Do you use robotics for hip and knee replacements or is it only for one type? No, I use them for both. I use them for both hip and uh, knee replacements. It uh, gives me good uh, data for both of those things. Um, for knees, we're really good at using the robot to get good balance uh, of the knee. We're able to get uh, good. Uh, we're able to get good measurements of the range of motion as well. How straight can the knee go? How much? How much can it bend? Are we starting off with any contractures beforehand? All that is good information that the robot can give us with knees. With hips, we can use it to get excellent placement of uh, the the new um, acetabular component or the the shell the, or the cup in the in the pelvis. We get excellent position of that. We can also see what our range of motion is for the hip, and we can use it to recreate uh, the the leg lengths between the two sides. We can get data about that down to the millimeter. Thank you. If someone's in their early 80s with a lot of arthritis in their knee, are they still a candidate for knee replacement? Absolutely, absolutely. Age is not not a concern uh, for hip and knee replacements. Um, the the youngest patient that I've done a hip replacement on was a 19 years old, and the oldest I've done this on is 96 years old. So it's a big range. Um, age is certainly not a contraindication to getting this done. What is a something that does concern us is poor health. So poor health broadly means uh, the presence of m multiple other medical problems like heart problems and lung problems and diabetes and chronic wounds and all, uh, all these other problems do, does make surgery riskier. So that's something that we would need to work with your primary care doctor um, or, or your other doctors to help improve the general state of health to, to make this a more successful surgery. But just age by itself, is not a reason to not do this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is the decision to do a total knee replacement or a partial knee replacement set in advance or do plans change when the surgeon actually is looking at your uh, body in the operating room? Yeah, um, good question. So if someone has very limited arthritis in their knee, only one spot or one part of the knee, we can go in with a plan for a partial knee replacement, and that's fine. Um, but I don't want to be stuck in the operating room without um, the ability to do a total knee replacement if the need is there. So if there, if I encounter arthritis in other parts of the knee, it's, uh, I don't feel that it's ethical to leave that alone and just say, oh, well, you know, we only talked about a partial, so I'm only going to do a partial and ignore the, the rest of the knee where there is still disease. I don't think that really serves the patient um, uh, well. So I usually will let patients know that, hey, um, more than 90% chance that since we've done our homework, 
then I'm thinking that we can get by with a partial knee replacement. But if there is a chance that there is arthritis in the rest of the knee, then we'll go ahead and do a total knee replacement. And, and honestly, I this has happened to me only one time in, in my co- whole career where we ended up needing to actually do a total knee replacement. And we did and everything's fine. But majority of the time we're able to just stick to a partial replacement. But we should have the opportunity or the chance or uh, option to do a total if needed. Thank you. For hip and knee replacements, what is the recovery and rehabilitation time? It is a gradual recovery. So when do patients start walking after these? Same day, you know, same day before you, within a couple hours, you're up and standing on your own two feet and walking with a walker. But what does full recovery really mean? And that's, you know, it's it's hard to define, right? But I tell patients that they'll be in pretty good shape to do most things by about two to three months after surgery. If they're asking me because they need to dis- discuss with their employer or HR of how much time to take off from surgery, I-, I recommend to patients to plan for and budget for about two months. Many patients are better much sooner than then and great, and they can do what they want with the extra time off. If they want to go back to work early, sure. If they don't, sure. Um, but it's it's up to them. But I tell patients to plan for about two to three months. Thank you. How long do you have to to do those hip uh, limitations that you described where you can't get in certain postures? Yeah, if we do a posture approach, I usually will do these uh, hip precautions for about uh, three months uh, after the surgery. Um, with the anterior approach, I don't do any precautions. So you can you can do all you can pretty much do everything from from right away. Um, having said that. Why, why do we even have precautions in the first place? Well, we have precautions to decrease the risk of dislocation. So does that mean that after three months, there's no more risk for dislocations? Uh, no, unfortunately, there is a lifelong risk for dislocation. If you have you know, a bad fall, for example, where you're doing the splits or your leg is just going behind your head or whatever, you know, those those kinds of things unfortunately can produce a, a dislocation. Sometimes I have seen dislocations in patients even 10 years after surgery. Um, in your native hip, in a unreplaced hip, there is a small ligament inside the joint that it prevents a dislocation by, by not letting the ball come out of the socket. Well, in a artificial joint, we haven't figured out how to do that. We don't have a little rope i guess you know from the middle of the socket to the middle of the ball that can stop that from happening so that dislocation risk is lifelong but precautions generally i think three months is is enough thank you if somebody has osteoarthritis in their knee and tears in their meniscus Mm -hmm. should they have a knee replacement surgery or is there a surgery for replacement of meniscus how do those interact Good question. In the presence of osteoarthritis of the knee, and let's say it's already moderate to severe in the knee, and they have meniscus tears as well in the knee, at that point, I I think that the only surgical treatment for that patient should be replacement surgery if and when they they feel that they want to move forward with that. The reason I don't think that any limited meniscal surgery will be beneficial for the patient is because in arthritis, the cartilage is is damaged and that does not get addressed with meniscal surgeries and there is no way to address the cartilage problem there's no way to put cartilage back where it's gone so in someone who has cartilage loss aka arthritis as well as a meniscus problem just addressing the meniscus problem will not solve the other pain in the knee so it's not a worthwhile surgery to do a just meniscus treatment thank you how beneficial is hip replacement for someone with a history of labral tears? If somebody already has a labral tear, is hip replacement helpful? In, yes. In um, if they, we 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 don't we don't do hip replacement for only labral tears. So they have to have a patient should also have arthritis as well um, uh, for for us to consider doing a hip replacement. Um, but the presence of labral tears during the in the presence of arthritis, it doesn't change anything. We can still do a successful hip replacement. We don't need the labrum anymore when we're doing a replacement. So we actually just remove the existing labrum. It's not necessary, not needed anymore. We take it out routinely. Thank you. Are decisions about saving muscles and connective tissues made on the fly in the operating room once you're able to actually see the anatomy? 
or are there standard procedures that you use every time? Yeah, good question. So pretty much standard procedures that I use uh, every time um, for for first time hip replacements or primary hip replacements, I do the same anterior approach, which is a limited approach and saves the, the muscle and the, and the um, you know, connective tissue. Um, for knees, um, that's the one that I, I mentioned earlier where I'll try to do the, the more muscle sparing or subvastus approach for most patients and I am able to successfully do it. But if, um, if I can't or if it's too tight, it's not like we'll abandon the surgery, so we'll go ahead and, and actually extend the incision, extend the approach, and go ahead and do what we came to accomplish um, by replacing the, the joint, even with a little bit of a longer incision if we need to. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Someone says that they had both knees replaced over a decade ago, and now they've been recently experiencing pain in their knees, but also pain in their hips. How do they tell if their knee replacements are wearing out or if it's a problem with their hips? Yeah, good question. You know, uh, uh, the, these sorts of problems typically should be evaluated by someone like me in the office um, because it's going to give me a chance to get a better history from the patient and a good examination of the patient and more importantly, some imaging studies like x-rays as well. Um, if they are, uh, if they were done 10 years ago and if they are starting to show some wear and tear at this point, uh, that can explain some of the pain in the knees. And if they are then changing the way they walk for because of the knee pain, that can actually start to produce some hip pain. Doesn't necessarily mean hip arthritis. It can be some bursitis or some muscle or tendon pain, but that could potentially explain some of the hip pain that they might be having. Thank you. Do you recommend using a continuous motion machine after knee surgery? Yeah, good, good question. This is the, the CPM machine or the continuous passive motion machine is, is um, has certainly fallen out of favor. We really don't do that uh, much anymore. It is uh, probably still something that can be used in very, very limited cases in, in very special situations, but for most patients, it's, it's really not necessary. In fact, the problem with the CPM machine in the past was that it was routinely done for everybody after a knee replacement. They would just lay in bed, put their leg in the machine, and then the expectation was that the machine was going to then do everything for them with, with their movement and strength. But we found that it's actually the muscle activation, meaning the patient actively thinking and choosing to move their muscles, which is what improves strength and range of motion in the knee not just if it's being moved by by the machine that doesn't seem to produce as good results so so that the machine is not used as a crutch um, we expect patients to do the movements themselves thank you mm -hmm. you mentioned using medications other than narcotics for pain relief can you go into a little more detail about that does that include nerve blocks uh, yes it does uh, it's one of them um, the what I typically do, the protocol that I typically use is I will have patients on a scheduled high dose acetaminophen or Tylenol, which is a, uh, as you all know, is a, is a pain medication that typically works more in the brain. I also do an anti-inflammatory medicine, typically Celebrex, which is uh, acts more in the operated area, the, the hip or the knee to reduce local inflammation. I also do a nerve medicine, typically Lyrica, which desensitizes the nerves in between the joint and the brain. So basically the wires. Um, and, and these are scheduled medicines. These are not ones you're going to take only if you have pain. No, you're going to take these on the set schedule around the clock. By doing it that way, your need for breakthrough pain medications such as uh, tramadol or oxycodone is going to be much lower. And uh, those are two different types of, or two two separate narcotics. One is a low, lower strength and one is a higher strength. And so you will decide, the patient will decide which of those to, to reach for depending on how much pain uh, they have. So that's typically the pain management uh, protocol that I use for, from a tablet standpoint. In addition, the anesthesiologist will usually do a nerve block as well for, for knees, which helps control pain for easily, you know, 12 to 24 hours afterwards, uh, after the surgery as well. Thank you. Are there special scans or tests that are needed before you have robotic surgery? 
Yes, there, there's a CT scan that uh, that needs to be done beforehand, and that's what we use to get the virtual 3D model of, of your joints, of your hip and, and the knee, as well as leg length information, um, as as well as any deformity information, like if your knee, if you've got knock knee uh, deformity, or if you have a, uh, you know, like a cowboy stance uh, deformity, one of those things. The CT scan is very good at giving us that information beforehand. Thank you. After surgery, is the osteoarthritis in the joint entirely gone or how do those intersect with each other? Good question. The answer is yes. There, there is no more arthritis in the joint. Um, why is that? Well, because the way we define arthritis is that the, the, the here's a model. <laughs> The, the way the, the knee moves, so it's the bone rubbing against bone is what, what causes pain in arthritis. So in a replaced joint such as this, you can see that there is no more bone rubbing on bone at any point. As the knee moves back and forth or bends and straightens, it's the implants rubbing against each other or the metal rubbing on plastic, even on the back of the kneecap, plastic. So. The, the, because there's no more bone rubbing on bone, there's no more chance for arthritis uh, in the joint. Thank you. Can you kneel after a knee replacement? Yeah, uh, yes, you can, but it kind of depends on the type of incision that is done on, on the knee. Now, in the past, and, and the way I was actually trained was to do straight line incisions because uh, I was taught that patients really appreciated having a straight line on their knee. It created maybe a, a bit of a, a positive psychological effect for them to think that it was it was straightened out. But unfortunately, over time, I've started to learn that that straight incision goes right over the middle of the kneecap, which is exactly where someone would uh, uh, would kneel on. Uh, but but so because of that discomfort, I've started to switch. Uh, my incision around so now I do a more of a curved incision more to the uh, inside part of the kneecap so that the part that the, someone would actually kneel on is not the part that I'm going to cut through so I found that it has created less sensitivity for patients on their knees when they kneel on them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Someone is describing a knee that feels like it's not like a greased hinge but it doesn't have pain. Is that something that they need to worry about? Do they need to go ahead and talk to a surgeon? Yeah, good question. It's um, so someone. It sounds to me like the, you're describing somebody that might have arthritis in their knee, um, but is not painful. So they feel like they might have a bone on bone type situation, but not painful. Um, to them, I say enjoy your joint as long as it's not painful. Um, you know that person might have arthritis, and uh, that is something that should still be checked by by someone like me, um, and. If I can confirm that diagnosis and uh, make sure that they are really are not in much pain, I can give them some reassurance. And maybe we can make a plan for some kind of routine checkup, something like maybe once every six months or once every year with a routine simple x-ray in the office to make sure that things are relatively stable. Thank you. Uh, Baker cysts, if they exist before the knee replacement, mm -hmm. will they go away after the knee replacement? Um, they, they typically do get smaller even after a knee replacement. I mean, after knee replacement, they typically do get smaller. So why did they even come about in the first place? Well, the presence of arthritis beforehand can make the knee more inflamed and irritated, which produces more fluid. That's the knee's response to all kinds of injuries is make more fluid. And that fluid has to go somewhere. So it usually escapes out the, to the back of the knee and into the calf area and they collects over there, which is why we call, which is what we call a Baker cyst. When we do a joint replacement, because there is no more arthritis and no more bone rubbing on bone, the production of fluid will also slow down, um, which can then eventually cause the Baker cyst to not really get filled up uh, like it was before and over time just go away. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Goganini. We did not have a chance to answer all of the questions, but we will be answering them in the comments on Facebook. Dr. Goganini, would you like to close? Sure, yes. Um, first of all, thank you everybody for, th for taking the time to attend this talk. I really appreciate it. So if you think that, uh, if you thought this, this information would be, it was useful to you um, and you think it'd be useful to a friend or a family member, please share it with the share button. 
Uh, if there are any other topics you'd like to hear about, please let us know by putting them in the, um, in the comments. Or let me know in person when you come to see me in the office. You can find me at our Ashburn or our Stone Springs offices. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.